want to give you a brief idea about what we are going to, what you're going to get what you're going to see because i want to mention this journey of the admin how they start with the product when it comes to any solution of that serves a back and application access we want to make sure that with with spa or citrix secure private access we are giving at every touch point starting from the point where they are actually doing a poc to production they have everything available for them to profile the apps which is know what exactly is being served in the back end from their end users secondly to configure those applications and thirdly to be able to troubleshoot if any issue arises so starting with the first feature that we offer is what we call as the app discovery feature which means let's say you're a you're a customer who's just thought of purchasing Citrix Secure Private Access, you're doing your POCs, but what you want to know is what all are the applications that are being served through my customers or through my end users that I want to really configure in my environment. What we do with, what we do with this feature is make it easier for you by automatically enabling uh, you to see all of your endpoints in the form of FQDNs and IPs and IP ranges that are being accessed by some of your end users, let's say in this case, some of your test users, to help you know that, hey, admin, these are your endpoints in your backend applications that you would rather want to consider if you want to give access to. And these are the users who are actually accessing them. So maybe have a look at them. So at a point when they are just beginning on day zero, we have a solution and a feature which tells them that this is what your infra looks like for your backend applications. This is what we have discovered. You might want to consider this. Secondly, we when the admin comes at a stage when they're actually configuring these applications, we not only have a UI-based workflow, which by the way is pretty easy and simple to go through, but we have other mechanisms which make their lives a lot easier, such as we allow UI-based UI configuration, but also REST APIs to configure everything, or there's CSV-based methods wherein they can just a lot of times have all that information already in a CSV file. All they got to do is just upload it once and voila, they have their environment and the infrastructure set up. Um, we got some automation done for some of the SaaS apps like Office 365, which is one of the top used apps when it comes to SaaS applications, which is all they got to do is just let us know that I want Office 365 to be served to my end users. As soon as they click on the Office 365 template or the button, all of the end user, all of the URLs and everything that needs to be configured for the app happens automatically. And thirdly, it's pretty easy to know what eventual, what event, what is the end result of these applications is because it's a priority based policy mechanism. So we make sure that for the admin, it's easy to create these applications and manage them. Uh, and let's say once you have already created and configured these applications, right? Um, it becomes, it, it usually comes to a point when all of these enterprises have so many applications in the back end and so many policies created that it becomes difficult for these admins to step into the shoes of the end user and know what is the end user actually going to get access to because it's just so many application policies and so many applications. So we want to solve for that by giving you a policy modeling tool, which means the admin can, from sitting at wherever their desktop is, get to know that this one user among their 30 applications are getting access to these 10, are getting a restricted access with a lot of DLP settings on the other 10, and then they're getting blocked on the rest 10, which means that it's a lot more proactive approach for the admin to see which user is getting access to what already by this, all of the configurations that they've already done. And if they want to do any changes, if they want to make changes on their configurations, they can already do that even before an access issue has already happened. So that's a proactive approach to make sure that the access is already working as the admin or the customer would want it to work. And lastly, coming on to the troubleshooting, something that I already touched upon a bit, we have a very unified and very detailed uh, troubleshooting mechanisms from what we call as a monitor, wherein not only your help desk personas, but your admins can get access to all the information which you want them to get access to, which is who accessed the app, what was the backend accessed, what is the endpoint uh, IPs, what are the user IPs, what are the nodes which they touched upon, what geolocation are they coming in from, what are the connector appliance specifications, what are the policies that were consumed. So we give you everything. If there is a failure at, in the whole topo topology of the infrastructure, we also point out on the topology as to where the failure happened. I think this is very important that a right troubleshooting mechanism is offered by the solutions and this is something we have concentrated on a lot and um, something I, I feel that really helps you bring out um, an ease for your help desk personas and your admins to just really quickly resolve all the app access issues if it might come 
if once the app access happens. Question for you, um, mm -hmm. how do you differentiate and manage policies around personal use, individual use versus corporate? They have a Gmail, you know, Gmail account versus a Google Workspace account if I'm doing that, or maybe I have my own Office 365 account plus what the corporation has. You know, we live in a world where people want to do that. Some environments you can lock that down, others are a little more flexible. Do you mean that, I've got like just a question just so that I can clarify mm -hmm. that. Um, so the way we work, first of all, is for any application for you to get access to, it, you gotta have it profiled using either an FQDN or an IP address depending on what the application is, right? And once you have profile, and maybe once you're on the agent that I called upon, is then only when you're getting access to those backend applications. So for instance, in your case, an Office 365 or a Gmail app, and if you want that to be restricted too, which is basically just a SaaS app, right? And you have a managed device where you, have, where you somehow, yes, can control your preferred native browsers as well. Because obviously, if you're coming in from a non-managed device, you can easily access the Gmails. Right. But let's say, and I've got a very cool use case for this, because one of our customers has an Office 365 uh, configured, which is IP restricted, which means only access allowed from when the IP is off our connected appliance, which means anyone who accesses their Office 365 coming in from any other IPs would be blocked, would not be allowed to log in, basically. So there is ways in which some of these end user, these applications provide you methods in which we can kind of integrate with our solution to do IP restrictions. Or as I said, if you have some ways on restricting where your native browsers can be blocked for usage on the managed devices, which a lot of customers can do, then through the enterprise browser um, or using the agent, you can block them off with our SPA policies, which is you only restrict access to those FQDNs and IPs to the user who you would, who you would add on the policies. Okay, I, I understand the capabilities. I'm not sure you manage the complexity of. I want to. I want to. Let's say for some users, mm -hmm. let's say uh, our, our CEO, mm -hmm. you know, he, he <laughs> needs to get to whatever he wants. Right? He yes. wants to get to his corporate and to his personal Office 365 account. Yes. You know, I'm working in. You know, let's say the the insurance claims part of the organization, and several specific tasks, so I can be limited on what applications I can use. Yes. How can you open up things for some users? I'm using that as kind of an edge case where there might be a lot of flexibility versus very limited. Yes, yes. Can you talk about how you would do that? Which is, if the question just to clarify is that how would you just give different kinds of access levels for different users? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that's what we do with our access policies, wherein let's say you've configured a, and Rena would show you that in the demos also, okay. which is, is agent or browser or both? It is the, both. Both, okay. both, yes. Which is if you want access for certain users to be getting access to only certain applications, you can you can have a mechanism and which is a very granular mechanism in which you can set up as to who should get access to what. And you can differentiate between, let's say in this case, the CEO getting access to the CEO applications and in case like you getting application, access to the applications that you need access for. Almost, so they almost to like use it very loosely the term <laughs> like an AD type base, not like tied, like specifically for Active Directory, but like similar where you can assign different permissions and groups and things of that nature and where they can access. But oh. there's a lot more, which is, yeah, that's correct, that's true, but there's a lot more based on okay. um, not just the identity, but also the device's posture, for instance. Okay. Maybe let's say if some user is coming in from a non-managed device or a device which you wouldn't want to get, get access to, or um, context, like the location or the network location or the mobile device or desktop. So there's a lot of granularity in which you can decide okay. who gets access. Obviously, there's just... Um, that user directory and the username and just the user profile as well that you can use. Thank you had mentioned once a user gets access that there's a continual um, process to check if they, if those um, parameters are still there. So if they um, no longer meet that that threshold, the access is cut. Did, uh, I got that correct? That is correct. Okay. And I'll, I'd like to touch upon that because I think that's a very important case as well. Um, let's take an example. Let's say if you're working from um, a country like, let's say, India, right? And you have set up a policy where you, you only want to give access to someone who's working from India to get access to this backend application and no one else. As soon as your geolocation changes, you can decide, and that's also admin's flexibility. Maybe you would want to have your DLP settings kick in from the enterprise browser to give a more secured version of access with a lot more security layers. That's possible. Or you can just completely block access. But you're right. Immediately, the, the access will be impacted based on if anything changes 
while the access is happening as well. Okay. Yeah. So two quick questions. So one, you were mentioning with the geolocation. So let's say you already have, you know, when you pre-configure this and apply all the permissions, policies, et cetera, geolocation set. But if you like travel somewhere else and you don't let, you know, be it the help desk team or an engineer know, it'll just kick that access first, like a security measure, right? Like it's like, wait a minute, yes. this is tied to this. Okay, cool. Yes. And the second thing, and I guess it doesn't matter so much now, but a few, a few jobs ago to their lifetime, I was doing generalist work. For, and what it is is in healthcare, we would always have new new hires start. Yes. So this would be pretty cool because what I would have to do is set up the AD accounts, PowerShell scripts to do everything. But when I'd have to provision their equipment, you know, it's like, okay, well, two of these people are for HR. This yeah. one's going to be for finance. This one's whatever. So I think this is pretty cool in the sense that maybe, like you said, the help desk team or, you know, the NOC could be able to go ahead and my provisioning accounts, kind of use this to supplement. Exactly. Make sure stuff set up. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And you have all of, all of these, the, what customers really like is that you have everything configured at one point. Yeah. All you end up doing is adding those users and different access policies the way you would see these users accessing these backend applications, right? So it's, it's just quick setup and easy access. I may have missed it too, but can you build out templates with these access policies? Like, so, yes. okay, that, okay, yes. okay. That's yeah, you awesome. can have free preset templates and you can just keep on adding users to that. And I wish I had this six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> just to clarify deployment, well, so if I want these capabilities, I've got to have either the uh, agent or the enterprise browser, the, um, the sort of uh, proxy service or, uh, and then the net scaler as well. Depends. If you're on the cloud, you can have um, a connected appliance, mm -hmm. which is cloud-hosted, Citrix-managed. Or you can have a net scaler, which can be the on-prem solution for you managed by the customer itself. Okay. That's correct, though, yes. So I don't need all three. I would or the other depending on... Correct, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks.